We are now recording. So today I just plan to kind of informally go continue with our discussion of transformer models. Uh, then we're going to get into some code uh, fine tuning. So that's the topic that I want to cover fine tuning transformer models. We've already seen um, using you know, out of the box transformer models already pre-trained, but no fine tuning, right? We use Albert, Roberta, um, Bert. Uh, and so today, um, you know, I wanna do a little bit of fine tuning just so that we can see how that works. Um, and, and you will get one assignment. Uh, this one's a little bit tougher, but should be very, uh, not, not very tough. I, I don't mean to say very tough, but should be interesting, an interesting assignment um, for you to work through. Uh, and I'll give you plenty of time as these assignments are a little bit bigger as you have noticed, probably, you know, just, you know, get them in. All right, so today we're gonna continue our discussion of transformer models, at least the first half. I'm not getting so much into the, into the code with these because they are extremely complex. Um, I, I do have a chapter that I, I wrote about them, like 100 pages, and I've been meaning to, I, I just need to make it into a PDF so that you guys can read through it. It's, it's the best way, I mean, it, it, it honestly is. All right, so uh, let's talk about transformers again. Now, you, you remember I already posted you know, one lecture, one video about this last week, I believe it was, um, and so this kind of, I've already covered some topics in that one. So I'm, I'm basically continuing the discussion from that one, okay? So transformer models came in in 2017. That's really important. They've only been around about five years at this time, which, you know, it's almost amazing. Uh, but they've revolutionized on, uh, machine learning quite a bit. They beat reinforced, they bit, uh, they beat RNNs, which were the NLP solution. And I would say RNNs have their merits. I'm not, you know, in terms of what transformers do, one big advantage that transformers have is that they parallelize really well. So they, they you know, they can handle lots of data efficiently, GPU, whereas uh, RNNs don't do so well on that. Right, and that's really one of the that's the downside for RNNs. They just they just can't process all that data efficiently, but they do have some merits. So, as far as NLP for me, I'm kind of staying you know away from RNNs for a while, and just exploring transformers uh, as much as possible. So, as we saw in in the model. Um, last week, transformers in 2017 have a very, very long name called the um, encoder decoder with multi-head attention. And that's really because that algorithm, the 2017 Baswani, is, is the original encoder decoder with multi-head attention. So it's really three things. It's three things that are that make up the transformer architecture. A lot of the transformers that we've been using this semester out of the box, like uh, BERT, all the BERT, BERT variants, uh, etc. they are actually, um, I have it here, the name. BERT is, in the original BERT paper, is pre-trained of deep bidirectional transformers for language understanding. And that original BERT model is an encoder-based model, okay? So the BERT model, basically, um, it's an encoder type of architecture, okay? So one way of thinking about it is that it's not that the, the the original encoder decoder with multi-head attention, 
but it's just a, a variant of that that just uses one part of the architecture called the encoder. So uh, and the way that we're going to think of, of, of our, you know, I'm focusing on the 2017 paper, right, the original one, and not necessarily BERT or Roberta or, or BART or GPT, right? GPT, for instance, would be an example of, an, of, of a transformer that uses both the encoder and the decoder, okay? But BERT would be an example that just uses the encoder, and then they have differences in architecture, et cetera. So just as a quick recap, we said that the act architecture actually changes a little bit depending on whether you're training or testing. And the reason why we said it changes is because of something called teacher forcing, right? So the models are created to predict words, but we don't want to use those predicted words to continue the training because then the training becomes corrupt. So the best way to understand a transformer is actually to start at the testing phase, right? So in the testing architecture, the transformer, if you remember, looks kind of like this. There's the encoder layer and the there's the encoder and decoder section, let's say. So this is the encoder. This is the decoder, right? And then we have the inputs that come in here. And then we get something that is the encoder output. So this is the encoder. This is the encoder output. And then this encoder output becomes an input to the decoder itself. The decoder then has other inputs that go into the decoder and then it predicts here, there's a final linear layer inside the network. And then it predicts the decoder output, which is basically the word. So it predicts a word. This vector is, think of it as size of vocabulary. And it's going to predict one of these as the output, right? So it predicts a word. So basically, we give it an input here. So if we think of the example of language translation, this is an input which is going to be n by 40, let's say, because we feed it batches where 40 is the size of the sentence, if you want to think of it that way. Although it's not a sentence, but a sequence of tokens. Because sentences or words can actually be broken up into subwords. But let's say it's something, some sequence. And then the next part is the embedding and the positional encoding. And what this does is, if you think about it, here in the input, we have the cat is and then blank. We don't know what the next word is. So the cat is. So the cat is is fed into that tensor of size n by 40. Do you guys see that? Does that make sense? All right. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so we feed the, the cat is. And we might, you know, you know, and we feed that, right? And then we want to predict the word, the next word. So the cat is, those three words have to be converted from strings into ID. So I'm sure when you're, you've been looking at uh, the transformer modules, you have seen that every time that we instantiate a new transformer, we do th two things, right? We download a tokenizer, and then we download a model. Have you guys noticed that, that we do that a lot? And it's maybe a little annoying even, but that's the way it works, right? We, we download two things uh, from hug and face, let's say, the, 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 the pre-trained tokenizer and the pre-trained model. So what is this tokenizer? This tokenizer is basically a technique that has looked at the entire corpus, and then it has assigned for each sentence an ID. So for instance, the is probably like three, Cat is probably 17, is could be, you know, 88, whatever, right? These are the IDs. So whenever we give an input to the transformer, what we give is these IDs, and that's the job of the tokenizer. Additionally, we add these special characters. 
So we add start of sentence, end of sentence, and there's other ones like unknown, mask, etc. So there's a lot of things that we can add in here, okay? But that's the job of the tokenizer. All of it is the job of the tokenizer to convert this into a uh, string. So this is probably one. And then the last one would probably be, it's usually the last number. So let's say if this is 5,000 words, then this would be 5,001. So that string of tokens is what we provide, okay, to the model. Now, notice that because we're using tensors, the tensors need to be of a fixed size. So in this case, the tensors are of size um, 40. But this sentence, the cat is, is not size 40. So then what happens? Usually in the tokenizer, we have to say things like max length 40. And then we say something padding. And we also say truncate. You've probably seen that, or at least you'll see that today. And what that means is if the sentence is longer than 40, truncate it. That means, you know, ignore the last few tokens. If the sentence is less than 40, add padding, which means add zeros. This is also, you may have noticed another thing that you get when, when you tokenize things. You don't just get the IDs, or the IDs, sorry, the IDs, but you also get what? what? What else have you noticed that you get when you use a tokenizer? Have you noticed that we get the IDs? I'm going to change this color. I don't know. And we also get something called the masks. What do you think these masks are? Uh, the close approximation to the correct answer. Uh, no, actually, the masks are very simple. The masks are an indication of where the tokens are. So for instance, let's say that I have this, right? And the cat is, and then that's it. So then this would be 3, 7, 17, 88, and then the rest is padding. So the rest is going to be zeros. You see that? Dot, 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 zeros. So the mask is really a way to tell the algorithm also where the tokens are located. Do you see that? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, kind of. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit, it's, it's, a, it's a big thing to wrap your head around. I, I know, I know, believe me. But uh, the idea is this, you know, when you guys were doing the, the prediction, right? So you said the cat is masked. What were you doing? You were providing in there a mask of where the word was that you would ignore. So the cat is masked. You see that? So this is how transformers do this efficiently because everything is a matrix multiplication. You always wanna have a handy way without an algorithm, without a for loop or anything like that of indicating where the tokens are. Let's say that, let's say for instance, that we actually had, okay, Wyatt, go ahead. What's your question? So is this positional encoding? This is not positional encoding. Masking is not yet positional encoding, but we'll talk, that, that's a good one. Good question. Okay. So let's think of another example. Let's say that, that I want, that I know the cat is sleeping and the word is there sleeping. We don't actually delete the word sleeping. You see that? We don't. We don't. Instead, what we do is we mask it by saying, for instance, you know, we, we have in here sleeping, let's say, would be 504. But if you notice, the mask says zero. Do you see that? And so what the algorithm will do, it doesn't matter that the word is there. It's going to multiply it times zero. It's gone. And this is the trick that transformers use for all this masking, for all this like ignoring of terms. You see that? That's the basic idea here. Okay, so that's one element that we're always gonna need in there. Now, the, the question that Jason um, brought up is actually very good because 
that's the next thing. If you notice in the input, right, the input takes the sentence, converts it into the IDs to the tokenizer, but we also have masks. Then notice here, we, I have another little thing here that's called embedding and what he said, positional encoding. So that's actually two things. So the transformer, and this is very fascinating, it does not actually represent the words as IDs. The IDs are just a reference. There is something called distributed vector representations or word embeddings. What that means is that we decide, I decide for instance, you know what? I'm gonna take a vocabulary of 50,000 words. I already have the IDs, but I wanna represent each word, the, car, hello, etc as vectors of size 128. Do you guys see that? So this is a vector space of size 128, R128. So every word is gonna be a point in this vector space. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. So we represent every word as a vector of size 128. So now, you know, how do you calculate this? This is usually uh, calculated through an algorithm such as word to vec where word to vec would look at the co-occurrence of words. So the, the word car and motor appear a lot together. So what would happen is in this vector space, car and motor are closer than say, hello. That's, there's an algorithm that basically assigns the, all these 128 values based on co-occurrence. And then each word is represented as a vector of size 128. Do you guys understand this idea? Yeah, yes. yes. Okay, so now that was, that was the state of the art for a long time, but then the people with transformers said, mm, okay, I know what I'm gonna do. I take in N by 40, and now all I'm going to do is I'm going to do some calculations here, and I'm going to convert n by 40 into, and I'm going to use a different color. I'm going to convert n by 40 into n by 40 by 128. Do you guys see that? I added this new dimension where now every single one of these IDs, the 40 IDs, but only the ones that have a mask of one, right? So the other ones are completely ignored so that efficiently you don't have to do that. And so now every word is actually a vector of size 128. That's why it becomes now a tensor, right? N by 40 by 128. Remember, N is the number of batches. And then now every single one of these is a... Um, is a, um, a vector of size 128. Do you know what these values are? No. Initially, when the, remember the transformers are trained, like GPT-3 was trained with like the most data that anyone has ever used or something like that, right? By OpenAI, I think. So the, they basically said, <clears throat> convert the dimensions from this to that, leave them randomized, but as we feed it data, it's gonna learn the vector representation. So in a sense, it's like word to vec, but built in into the transformer and it doesn't use the criteria specifically of word to vec, it just uses its own transformer-based vector representation. Got it? All right, all right, great. Now, going to uh, Jason's question. So what about this positional encoding? So you might ask the question, well, how do I, you know, in RNNs, in RNNs, um, you have sequence, right? The cat is sleeping. And then in the network, you literally represent this as a sequence. You need to know this one to get that one and that one. So you, you maintain the sequence. In a bag of words approach, if you remember that concept from previous classes, we would lose sequence. So what about in transformer? So obviously sequence is important. So how do you deal with that? Well, 
that's where positional encoding comes in. Positional encoding basically says that there is uh, a tensor of 40, right? It looks at the 40 and it's gonna say, okay, well, there's 40 token that the, si the size of the tensor, but really because of the mask, I know that there's only, let's say four. These are the tokens which are assigned to their 128 vector, 128 vector, 128 vector, 128 vector. I need to somehow know that this one is the first one, the second one, the third one, and the fourth one, right? I wanna maintain that sequence. So positional encoding does that. It basically creates it's it's amazing how it does it, right? It creates, let's say, a 40 by 128 matrix, right? So 40 by 128. So every one of these is a word or, or tokens as they're referred to. And here you have the dimensionality. You see that? Kind of like that. So it uses pure uh, algebra to create a function. And it's a function, you can think of it like this. So the, the most intuitive thing I can say about this function is that the function is like this. You guys see that? So this function is mapped here. So what do you notice about this function? It's getting, it's getting bigger. So I, I probably didn't make this uh, in a good scale. I think. You see that? So what happens is each vector of size 128, as it, go, as it goes in that direction, gets a little bit more of this. You see here, it's just like kind of here. This is a little bit broader. This is a little bit broader. This is a little bit broader. So that's... You can, you can almost think of it that way, that that amount of noise or whatever, but it, it's actually a function, a sine and cosines actually. That amount of, of function or noise that is added to it indicates the position relative to the other ones because it indicates that one has more that's further. So it, it, this is the positional encoding. Jason? Yeah. Idea? I think so, a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it, so so that's you know that's what's happening. So you're capturing the sequence instead of capturing this order like this, you're encoding it into the vector, and so it's gonna know you know each word if it's before or after given by this amount of, of encoding that's happening. Okay, and so that's the next step in the transformer is that you have the embeddings and also the positional encoding that happens. In it. And then once you have that, you're ready to go. Now you have your input. It is going to be a vector of size n by 40 by 128, where it's got the embeddings and it's also got the, um, it, it also has the, the positional encoding. And then almost, if you want, you can think of it as an image, right? It's almost like a picture. Right, in a sense, it's got all that information. So, if we were feeding um, images, you know, RGB, right? So, we would have, you know, N by uh, 28 by 28 by 3. Well, here is N by 40 by 128. And by the way, the positional encoding was added to the, to the image. And, you know, we are able to capture the sequence by these functions, the amount of information that we put in. So I think that's a good intuition of how to think about it. Once we have the input, the next step is to go into the encoder itself and then get our encoder output, which should also be n by 40 by 128, right? So it basically just transforms and hence the name transformers. It'll transform this vector into this vector a context basically. Right? And then that context is fed into the decoder. Here also, in, in the example of the, of the translation from, let's say, English to Spanish, we're going to feed another 
n by 40. Okay, but this is going to be the Spanish sentence, follows the exact same process. Exact same process. And so we have the total English sentence, and then we've got the Spanish sentence. So in, in the testing phase, we would take the, the converted English sentence, right? Because we would have that whole thing, right? We would have the whole English sentence. And then we start predicting the Spanish sentence in a loop. So it's almost like in a loop like this, because we're gonna predict word for word. So what that means is, you know, let's say over here, right? So we have the two, and we, now I'm just gonna say the cat, is sleeping, right? You want to translate this. So you would start actually at the starting symbol. You don't even know because you need to translate the four words into the Spanish, right? So again, this is testing phase only. So what's going to happen is you give it the cat is sleeping English, and now you give it the starting symbol to the decoder. This is the encoder. And then there's a ton of layers here, but at the output here would be the word in the other language. So in this case, well, if the input is the cat is sleeping and then I have a, a starting symbol S, the word is L, Spanish for the. Great. Once I do that, next iteration, I send L and I add it here, L. Do you see that? And so now I'm gonna say, Okay, that cat is, I have S and L, so cat predicts this word. That's the Spanish word for cat. Then what does it do? It grabs this word and adds it here, and it repeats the cycle. And now it has the English, the cat is sleeping, and then it's got this symbol, and then it's gonna predict the ne next one. So it's going to be that word, which is the equivalent for is. And so now it adds it again to the, to the sentence as an input, repeats the process again. And it, it, the cat is sleeping. It's got this. So now it needs to predict the next one. Predicts it. It adds it here. Now it, you know, repeats it again. And the cat is sleeping. This is already translated fully. So hopefully it would do that. And at that point, it ends because that is the ending symbol. Oops. Let me just write it down here instead. So it would provide that symbol. And at that point, the transformer model stops. Do you guys see that? That's how it works. Except that, as I said, you know, we need to convert it into numbers because that's all that. So we need to convert it into the IDs. That's n by 40, but then we add a dimension 128 for the, for the embeddings, very much like word to vec. We also add the positional encoding Right, so that happens here and here. And then we feed it through a whole bunch of layers, which is the next thing I'm gonna talk about, all these layers. And these are just mappings, okay? They're just mappings, one after the other, okay? They're basically matrix multiplications, you know, um, that, that are happening, but, but it's given the data that it has learned, right? So, the encoding does this, and then that is passed on to the next layer, and so on. Now, I've always thought actually that the testing phase is pretty intuitive. Okay, so to me, it seems like it's pretty intuitive. Um, you know, it's, this is a size of vocabulary. You know. Okay, so that is the 
testing phase. Now, the thing that's happening though, is that now you need to reconcile testing with training. Uh, yeah, so now we need to reconcile testing with training. Now you could do a transformer that follows this exact same logic. Just predict the word here and then boom, you know, um, it'll learn. But the problem with that approach is that it's gonna make mistakes, right? You would agree that, you know, machine learning algorithms are not perfect. So sometimes, you know, the cat is sleeping and then when we're doing the prediction, it would say the cat is, and then here it predicts, um, you know, no. So now the word is no, and that's not the right translation. And then, you know, it would just, and imagine if this is the training phase, the transformer would just start learning, you know, you know, garbage, right? Rubbish. And so it wouldn't be very good. And so that's why they need to find a solution to this problem. And so the solution that they found is something called teacher forcing, which is actually very clever. What they do is the transformer doesn't predict uh, just this, but it actually predicts a vector of n by 40 by um, vocabulary science. Can you see that? However, what's important about this is that it's always predicting the last word. And that's where masking becomes very useful. Because what you're keeping track of is where you are in the masking. So here, for instance, you're going to say, this is the input, where you are in the input. Disregard this part. So now the, the output, instead of just being the word, it's going to be here is mask like that. And here is the word that it predicted. You see, so it, that's why they're both the same size. If you notice, you know, this is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So they're actually n by 40 by vocabulary size, but there's still 40 tokens in there. And it's just predicting this one. You see that, which here is just a mask, if you will. Okay, so, so that's kind of the, the idea. So we, it's not actually just one word, but it's the same word uh, in both sides. And that's so the architecture can work in both the training and the testing, okay? But just remember intuitively, we're trying to predict the word and kind of pass it and then use it in the testing phase. That's exactly what we're doing. Uh, but in the training phase, actually what we're doing is we're using teacher forcing. So what that means is, again, we give it inputs, we encode it. So here we are giving it the cat is sleeping. You see that? And then here, we know in a training corpus, right? In a, assuming this is now training, training, for the example of English to Spanish translation, we have the English translation and the Spanish translation. So we would have the cat is sleeping. And then el gato está. We have it. We have the four sentences, right? And all we have to do is here, we give it the cat is sleeping. Here, we give it the Spanish word. But we shift it. So what that means is here we do So you see, we have the Spanish translation and we 
provided, but they are shifted. So this one maps to that one, that one maps to that one, that one maps to that one, that one maps to that one in the way that we give it. So if you think about it, they are actually uh, shifted because by one to the right. You see that? And this is how we are able to predict. So we give this as input. This is exactly the same, but we don't know what that one is. In the training, we do, because we have it right there. In the testing, that's the word that we need to get. But in the training, we always know which one we are trying to predict, because we have the same, it's like, it's like we give this, so, so think of it in simple terms, we give this here, and for the decoder, we take this one, make a copy of it, and now we have two copies of it, then shift by one, and now the shift, and so we feed the shifted by one here and the original one here. And then the model will learn to predict the last word. This way, the model in the training phase is always learning correct, correct sentences. You know, it's not based on its actual predictions. It's based on the real data. Whereas in the testing, as, as, as we saw, it's actually predicting the word and then adding it here, concatenating. It. But sure, that's what it should do when it's learned. Before learning, you have to do it this way. And this is called teacher forces. What do you guys think? Does this make sense? Intuitively? Yeah, I would say so. You think? All right, good. All right, perfect. So that's, you know, that's the transformer. That's the original transformer. Okay, the, the, the encoder decoder with multi-head attention. So it's an encoder, it's a decoder. It, this is tricky because we're not used to, you know, we're used to, I'm sure you guys, when you thought about this, you wanted to put the cat is sleeping here and the translation to Spanish here, and that's it. But we actually make two copies of it, shift one by one, and then we're always predicting the last word. Because at the end of the day, that's what we're going to predict. And then what, what we do to hide, so now this word is right there. The, the word is still there, but there's a mask, you see. So if I use another color, the mask would say one, 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 zero. So that it's called the look ahead mask. And what that means is that the transformer cannot see what this is, even though it's right there. That's, that's, that's kind of a, the job of these masks. It's a trick for GPUs to efficiently hide things, but by, by still making matrix multiplications, okay? And so that's kind of how that works. So if you understand that, then you understand that there's a training and the testing. And now all that remains is, okay, so what is inside the encoder and the decoder? You know, you might want to know. So what's inside these things? All right. And so that's the next thing. We're going to take a look at what's inside the encoder and the decoder. And they're actually very similar, I should say. The only difference is that here you, in the encoder, you only have the input, whereas in the decoder, you also have the encoded input going into every layer. So you, you have that context, right? So it's almost like here we have, now inside the encoder, we have six layers. That's the original architecture of, the, of this. And it's basically just matrix multiplication, you know, one after the other with one input. But here in the decoder, we have almost the same thing where this goes in, this goes in, this goes in, but now this also gets multiplied. You see that? That's basically what's happening here. So really what we need to do is we just need to zoom in into one of these, you know, one of these layers. If I explain one of these layers, I've explained every layer because they're very consistent, okay? And there's something, there's one additional thing to learn about, which is 
if you remember, the original name says encoder, decoder. And what is this? The multi-head attention, right? So that's the last thing, which, which this actually is supposed to give it a lot of the power. So let's take a look at that. Questions before I continue? Okay, so we're gonna zoom in into one of these layers. We're gonna call it encoder layer. Just keep in mind, they're very similar to the other layers. So we're gonna imagine I'm zooming in. I'm zooming in, so the encoder layer would look like this. I'm just looking at one layer, right? So one of these, right? Dot, dot, dot. I'm just going to zoom in into one. And this is going to be now the encoder layer. It takes one input and it gives one output. And the size is? n by 40 by 128 for our example. And the output is n by 40 by 128. So if you notice, if you want to think about it, it's just a tensor that gets multiplied by stuff and it gives another tensor. That's basically what it is. Okay. But inside, there's a couple of things. There's going to be two layers, actually. The decoder has three. The decoder layer has three because it has to have one layer that handles this, this part here, the encoder uh, output. But it's, it's basically the same thing. So these two layers, the first one takes the, the, whatever the input is, you know, maybe it, we're in encoder layer four. So it takes the output from encoder layer three and it's going to pass it to encoder layer five. That's it. So there's two layers in here. One is your standard fully connected layer. So any fully connected layer we studied in 520, that's it. You know, remember, we had uh, x times w plus b, and it gives us y, remember that? And then in the next layer, we had what? We, let's say we, we're gonna call this one actually h1. So now here is h1 times another w plus b, h2, and then h2 times w plus b, h3, and so on, right? So if you remember this, that's pretty much what's happening here. It's just a matrix multiplication, a mat mol, right? operation with weights and biases. However, so that's, that's not, you know, that's not remarkable or anything. It's just a neural net. This layer, however, is a little bit different. This layer here, the first one is where the name comes encoder decoder with multi-head attention. Okay, so this layer is gonna be called the multi-head attention layer. And notice it's called multi-head. So what that means is that in that layer, you're going to perform the same operation eight, uh, several times. Uh, the, the, the original Vaswani paper 2017, you always see that it, it says it uses eight heads. And what that means, you know, they call it the, the eight-headed monster. What that means is there's basically eight, what, eight times the same attention layer. Hey, and, and the intuition is that hopefully every one of those eight will look at the problem in a different way, very much like in CNNs, you have multiple uh, filters or multiple, you know, multiple, you know, you multiply the original image times 32 filters and hopefully every filter picks up something different. So here it's similar, but the mechanism here is not a convolution, it's an attention mechanism. So that's the difference, but they're actually intuitively similar, I would say. You guys see that?
Yeah. Okay, so so now let's use a little bit of code to explain this one a, a little bit further. Okay, so I'm gonna the best way with this part I think is to just use a little bit of code. So we're gonna say the encoder layer, right? So define encoder layer. Encoder layer takes the input x, the mask corresponding to that input, uh, and, and whatever else might be necessary. Okay. So then here, because it's eight heads, because it's eight heads, you're going to basically do this eight times. So you give it, you have a um, multi head attention. function and you give to it the x and the mass eight times. And don't worry about, I'll give you as I said, a PDF that I have, I'll post it somewhere. I just haven't, uh, I'm actually reading that right now, but I haven't uh, uh, generated the PDF. Um, so you, you guys can read all of this, if, you know, so anyway, you have this, I'll probably post it on, on the calendar or, or somewhere. So you do this eight times, very much in a sense like in CNN with the filters, I would say. At, at least that's my impression. Once you do these eight heads, the original input was N by 40 by, let, I'm gonna change the number to be consistent with the numbers I have here. So it's 512. Just remember I had used 128 before, but let's say that I had actually made it 512. There is this, this mapping of this function returns vectors of size, not 512, but size 64. So you can think of it as 64, but it returns eight of those. Okay, so every one of these is, uh, is, is one of these. So then there's a step, once you've done these eight, which is a concatenation step. And what you do here is that you concatenate all eight. And you concatenate all eight in here dot, 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 Z8, to reconstruct something that is N by 40 by 64. You only concatenate, by the way, the minus one, right? So minus one, so only the last layer. Do you guys see this? And so you, you kind of do, what, what happens here is you take the original input, you apply this function eight different times, and you produce tensors that are no longer of n by 40 by 512, but n by 40 by 64. And then the if you take 64 times 8, that should be 512. So you reconstruct a vector where part of it is from this one, part of it is from that one, and so on. Do you guys see that? And supposedly, I mean, it works, obviously. And that captures a lot of information. And then you have that, um, that idea. And then you just pass this vector, right? N40 by, so this becomes now N by 40 by 512. And that, if we go back here, sure, that's the little thing here. At, at 330, yeah, 630, yeah, thanks. So this produces, a tensor of n by 40 by five, let's say 128. You can go back to 128. And then that just goes into the next layer, which is the fully connected layer. Do you see that? Guys? Uh, yes. That's it. You know, so it becomes, think of it as. In a neural net, you you get an you know you get another tensor, and now the tensor just gets processed in the next layer. This is just a regular uh, neural network. 
there's a few other things that happen, like you add back the original, that's called a residual. So what, what that means basically is that to this one, you add the original X, which the original X was also N by 40 by 128. And that's called a residual, which basically means that in case these values are starting to become very small, you're still adding the original one. So you, so you avoid the, the so-called vanishing gradients. But that's, I don't, I don't wanna get into that too much because it's very technical, but just be aware there's, there's a few other things, but intuitively speaking though, this is how it works, okay? The attention mechanism, and then this is just passed to a regular feed forward layer. So you might ask then at this point, so what happens inside these multi-head attentions, right? So that's, and that's really like the, probably the most complicated thing to understand in transformers, because this involves the attention mechanism, okay? So, so the attention mechanism is actually not uh, complex, but there's, there, but I'll, you'll see that there's, there's a little bit that's going on. So now let's talk about the multi-head attention. In simple terms, what is the multi-head attention? Pretty simple. I'll do it with an example. The cat is sleeping, right? The cat is sleeping. If we go back to the original one, the cat is sleeping. Are you guys seeing this one? We feed it in here, that sentence, and that sentence gets processed and processed and processed and processed. That's why it's called encoder and transformer. It just gets encoded and encoded and encoded and encoded and so on. But it all depends on the output, right? Everything is connected until the end. Um, so everything is governed by the training set. So, and, and all you're doing along the way is that you're learning weights, 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 right? So what is happening in the attention? If you notice the input is the cat is sleeping. So intuitively, we can, we can, I can say, although it's a little bit more complicated than this, then the multi-head attention is just a multiple, it's just basically a similarity score between this and itself. So intuitively then, the attention mechanism is this. Just for this particular example, the cat is sleeping. Guess what goes here? The cat is sleeping. And then what's going to happen is, as the model is, is learning, it's going to assign weights based on the relationship of these things. So for instance, it's going to say, um, you know, what's a good example? The cat is sleeping. Oh, and meowing. So just, so just to give an idea, and meowing. So as it sees a lot of data, as it sees a lot of data in the corpus, what does it learn about cats? That they meow. So it's gonna say, the cat is sleeping and meowing. So hopefully it would see a lot of meowing related to cats and not to cars. And so it's gonna start paying attention. You see where the name comes from? It starts to pay attention to this idea. So it's gonna say, ah, cat and meowing, point eight. Cat and meowing, point eight. Whereas cat and Sleeping, it'll like 0 0.6, 0 0.6. But I'm just going to throw in a word here just to kind of car. So I would say the cat and car, 
this is the intuition of attention mechanism. This is happening a lot inside the transformer. The, the transformer, if we look at it from the big picture in these functions, It's, you know, you're get where, where is it that I have this? Here. So the, the transformer, you know, it's got all these attention layers, one in every encoder layer. And it's basically just comparing itself because it's getting so much information, right? It's going to start paying attention to important words like cat and meowing and, and things like that. And that helps the model so that the next time that it sees cat and meowing, it's going to know something about the world. And it's going to help it in the in the um, it's going to help it in the in the understanding basically on the lang of the language. That's what supposedly provides language understanding. The paper itself, Baswani's paper, actually was called "Attention is all you need," literally. So he was kind of it, it was like a bombshell where he was saying reinforcement learning. Uh, no, sorry, uh, recurrent neural networks are not needed. Attention is all you need. Basically, just this is what you need, and that's it. And that's in every encoder layer. Do you guys see that? Where you have car um, yes. at the bottom, and then it's by the, shouldn't that be under cat? Is that what you're trying to say? Because like car and though would be higher than car and cat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. Good, good point. Okay. Exactly. So car would not be correlated with cat, right? In the corpus or or black hole would not be correlated with cat. The 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 transformer would learn that over time. It learns. So just keep in mind, it learns to pay attention to the things that are important about the text by the context. And all of it is done by this so-called attention mechanism. This is the, the intuition. This is like the highest level that I can give you about this, okay? And just remember, you do it eight times in the original paper, but the output is only of size 64. And then because there's eight, you concatenate them. And then basically you end up with a representation where you, it's like you looked at it eight times, eight different ways of looking at the attention. Now, keep in mind, here I did it for the sentence. Uh, the tensor is of size n by 40 by 512 or 128, depending on what I'm using. So the attention mechanism would be 40 by 40. Do you see that? Because it's every token to every token. Now keep in mind, some of the tokens have a mask, so they're actually ignored, right? And it's only gonna pay attention to the tokens that have a one, one there. This is how you control what to look at when you're paying attention. So that's why the masks are really important. And I, and I admit, I mean, they're, they're uh, a little bit tricky to, to, to understand, it's, it's a, but it's, it's because of the whole parallel thing that this is how they solve the problem of, you know, of knowing what to look at. Any questions so far? I'm almost done actually. So um, I just have one more thing, but in a very high level, because for the decoder, it's the same thing. Only the, the decoder has two attentions, but one is the regular multi-head attention and the other one is for the, for the encoder output attention. So what that means is it's going to take into account the output from the encoder, but that, you know, but technically it's, it's very similar. At the end of the day, they're just matrix multiplications. Okay. This actually, I think is, is, is intuitive and understandable. There's one additional complexity to this, which is the thing that has, kind of confused me over the years about transformers. So there is actually these, the, the, the attention mechanism adds 
three abstractions, three additional abstractions called Q, K, and V. And it's confusing because they seem to come from like databases or information retrieval. I, I have a theory of why they use this. Um, but you actually, the, the, the thing is, you don't actually look at directly at the tokens. So you don't actually, you don't, you don't actually look at the 40 by 40 tokens directly. You look at them after you perform a transformation, okay? So the transformation is going to be in terms of Q, K, and V, which the names are Q is for queries, K is for keys, and V is for values. So you can see already there's some kind of weird thing going on here where you have key value pairs, and these key value pairs are somewhat related to queries. You see that? So I've always thought of this as they wanted to say that they're going to take the original tokens and they're going to sometimes make them queries. Sometimes they're going to make them keys. Sometimes they're going to make them values. And then they're going to relate these to each other. So it's like, you know, what is the value of this query? You know, what is the value of this key given, you know, this query and so on? You'll see what I'm talking about. In particular, this makes sense because you do this eight times. So you're kind of trying different things. So in the attention mechanism, um, we have these tensors, right? They're all tensors. We have the original X, which is N by 40 by 512 or 128. Right, I'm just trying to use 512 here so that the, my multiplications make sense because this is how I have it in my, in my document. You need to remember that every time what you're trying to learn is the weights. Remember that you're going to do this eight times. You're going to do this eight times. So instead of multiplying, let's say x, by x, right? If we if we did a matrix multiplication here, mat mol, you know, and this is for this would result in 40 by 40, right? But we don't do it like this. We don't do it directly like this. Instead, x gets converted into these three things, q, k, and v, and then we perform the operations on k, q, and v. So you'll see what I mean here. And this this is one of the more complex parts of this. So that's why I usually just try to understand like the math and how they do it in the math. And then intuitively, I suspect that they're doing what I said. They're just kind of like looking at X from multiple points of view and then trying to, trying to pay attention to certain things. So here we have, um, We're gonna we we are gonna do this, so I'm gonna do. Um, I just want to make sure I have enough room for this. So we need to calculate. I'm gonna go to another page. So we need to calculate k, q, and v from x, and then perform the attention mechanism. Right. So I'm gonna start with the first one to calculate q. I'm going to do mat mol, which is a matrix multiplication of x. Remember, x is the original, n by 40 by 512. Whatever the input it is, regardless of what layer you're on, is just that tensor. So you're going to do x times wq plus bq. So what is wq? It's just the weights. Matrix. So this is going to be, um, you know, a tensor. Let's say tensor of size n by five twelve by sixty four. So this is how you map from five twelve to sixty four. 
okay? So you're gonna basically take the original of size 512 and make it into 64. Then you have the bias, BQ, and that's just gonna be another tensor of size N by 40 by 64. So the key thing to understand here is that we take the original X and we're doing this. The standard, you know, linear transformation, right? We take an X, multiply it times some weight plus a bias, and we get a new value. And that's it. That's literally all that happens. So remember, instead of doing this in the attention to end up with 40 by 40, right? Instead of doing that, we're adding an additional component of taking the original X, multiplying it times some weight and a bias and getting a Q. This is the so-called queries, okay? The so-called queries. Then we do the next step, which is gonna be uh, calculating the keys, which is the same thing. We take K, mat mol, the original X, times WK plus BK. You see that? And this also take, we initialize another weights matrix. So this is a tensor. And this is going to be of N by 512 by 64. Remember, this is the way that by doing this multiplication, we're going to make the, these into size 64. We're compressing it a little bit but it's got some weights associated with it. Notice that. So that's really important because we're transforming it into this idea of queries. So we took the original X by multiplying it times some weights, we just made it into another thing. And by the way, we call that thing queries. Honestly, we could have called that thing cats and the other thing owls and the other thing mountains. It doesn't really matter. We're, we're it, you know, it, they made this to, fit, to, to make it seem like we're comparing queries to, key, to, to values and cues, but in my opinion, it's just, it could have been anything. And so here we have uh, BK also. Oops. So this is BK. And this is again a tensor of size um, n by 40 by 64. Remember, because we're going to do this eight times and concatenate 64 by 8, which is 512. So we're, we're compressing. And then the last one is once again v, the values, right? And again, Matt Mull of X times WV plus, oops, plus BV. And then we need to initialize this as WV. And again, it's just another tensor of weights N by 512 for this by 64. And the bias is BV. And this is another tensor of size N by 40 by 64. We perform the multiplication. So now, if you think about it, if we had just looked at this, this would have meant that we did 40 by 40. We did X by X, right? That's what intuitively is X by X, this. But the actual attention mechanism does not directly multiply these. It multiplies these with the weight. So it's almost like saying, well, it's X times some double, oops, that's terrible. It's actually not that one, but it's really X times W one, let's say, mat mol X, W2. You see that? So it's not the direct way, but you know, 
it's, it's another one, a transformed version of the excess. Now, one thing that's kind of important about this one is if you notice in this diagram, these two are the same, right? But are these two the same? Guys? I was actually going to ask about that. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Um, so when they get the weights, are those from the first like attention, um, like All running the attention thing? The first, previous layer is an n by forty by five twelve. You get okay. Well, like when it first starts, where do those weights come from then? Random. They're totally random. Oh, okay. So everything is random. Everything is random. Even the embeddings. But that's why after millions and millions of records, though, the weights are filled in and hopefully correctly. You see gotcha. That? Yeah. And one important thing about this one here is that they're the same. But by doing this little trick of Qs and Vs, these are no longer the same. And honestly, that to me is, is the thing. It's not so much, I wish almost that they had used ABC instead of K, Q, V, because it's confusing intuitively to people. Like they think those things have meaning. And it's almost like saying that embeddings have meaning, which they do, but we don't know what they are. And so, so here, what I, what I think is these X's are the same. These are not the same. The whole point is that they should not be the same, right? Because you know, you're trying to learn different weights. You start with some weights here, other weights here. These get adjusted and depending on your problem. Does this make sense, guys? Yeah, I get it. OK, great. And so now we've done the Qs, the Ks, and the Vs, right? We have them. And so you know what I had in the, in the other slide, that's what we, have, we would want to have here. So we want to have here you know, x by x so that we end up with a 40, so that we end up with a 40 by 40, right? But we now have our three things, and now comes the scores matrix. Let me do this in red to be consistent. So the scores matrix is the attention. So like this one, this thing here, this big thing that I did intuitively, actually is being done now here. And it's going to be a mat mole, not of x by x, but of the transform x's. So it's actually done q comma k. You see that? So, so it's going to be uh, q is this one and k is that one. These two get multiplied, and that gives you the thing that is by 40. You see, so not so. So very much, I, I like actually this, this one here because that's, that's almost how, how, how it looks, right? You guys understand, guys? So, yeah. So Q, K, and V are trying to do the transformations like we did um, like a couple weeks ago to the yeah. like eight different layers. So it's not always doing the same thing eight times. Exactly right. Exactly right. Okay. So you know, they literally become, okay, this is a query. This is a value, but they're always different because it's not the original X's is the X's multiplied times these weights, which initially these were weights are random. And then they get there. You're going to learn them, right? Because you have the training data, but they're learning these attention mechanisms. They're still paying attention to the 40 tokens, the masked ones, but from different points of view, from different points of view. And so once we have that, so we perform the scores matrix Q and K, there's some normalization that happens, et cetera. And that should give you when you do this operation, now you end up with n by 40 by 40. Because you know you do this for every input in the batch. 
So that ends up being n by 40 by 40. And now you've done, now you've paid attention. Okay, so now you've paid attention. Um, you, and all of this, I should say, it's always happening with the mask. Uh, the mask is there because, you know, if, if we're just doing the sentence, the cat is sleeping, right? We need to mask out the tokens that we don't care about, right? All the padding, et cetera, gets, gets masked out. So we only pay attention to one part of this, like maybe that little part, and everything else is a mask. But because it's a matrix op uh, operation, it's very efficient uh, in the GPU. OK, and then finally, Finally, we have to then do one last operation, which is multiplying it times the V. So now remember there's that V matrix. So we do one last one. Let's say, um, so, you know, I'm just gonna make up some values. So A, and this is mat mall. And this is now scores matrix times V, the other one. Okay, so this comes out to being some, this was N by 40 by 40, which is the scores matrix. And this V is, if you remember, N by 40 by 64. Right, that was uh, n by 40 by 64. And so what happens here is that this last transformation takes the scores matrix, if you look, takes the scores matrix and changes it back to n by 40 by 64, which is exactly what we need to be able to, um, and here, remember, we're multiplying these two. So we're multiplying this and that. So maybe this last transformation takes the scores matrix back to being this. And that's useful because then each head produces one of these and they get concatenated. So then now we go back to this idea where we, you know, each one of these gets concatenated back into something that is n by 40 by 5. So that's, that's basically what the V does. To be honest, you multiply it times the scores matrix. And, you know, I'm not saying that it's just about reshaping it. Obviously, the V has weights and it's another multiplication. So it, it probably somehow looks at the scores and the attention, and those modify um, the original n by 40 by 64. Right, so so there's there's some some semantic understanding there additionally going on, but that's it. That's hopefully that made sense. I, you know, transformers I've always said are the most complex deep learning algorithm um, in in all of deep learning. But I think if you understand that the attention mechanism is this, right, and I think this is intuitive, but that we don't want to do this operation. We want to do this operation because that makes them different. Then it makes sense to do this code here, these transformations. And then we multiply not x by x, but q and k. And then the v just allows us to do further, you know, further uh, transformation. And also, by the way, get our, our original 40 by 64. And that's it. That, those are the main ideas of the original transformer model um, 
there's, I mean, there's a few, there's a few other things that are like technic technical things, but as far as understanding the algorithm itself, that's to me, that's basically how, how you understand it. So, so, so that's it as far as me uh, and the explanation of transformers. Are there any, of the original, I should say, the original encoder decoder with multi-head attention from 2017. Remember that BERT is actually just, or let me do it. So the original is like this one, encoder, decoder, but BERT is really, as far as I understand it anyway, it's just an encoder architecture. Whereas GPT-3 and GPT-2 is actually more like the original uh, 2017. It has an encoder and a decoder, but they have, every, every single one of them has modified, modified the transformers, but the basic elements are always there. So anyway, that uh, concludes my lecture on transformers. Are there any questions? Would you guys say that you kind of understand how they work? Yeah, I think so. Okay, great. Yeah. And, 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 and as I said, one thing that I will do is I'll provide a 100 page <laughs> description that I have of this um, for you to read. It's got a, a few more details. So yeah, so it's not, they're not, this is why, hopefully now you understand why a lot of people just give up and use hug and fits, <laughs> right? So, because, you know, writing these from scratch is complex um, and so on. All right, so I'm not hearing any questions. This was the lecture part of today. So we started at 2.30. And it is now 2.30, 3.30, 30, 3.50, right? So it's an hour and 20, a little over. So let's take a 10 minute break. We will start at 4.04 .04 and we will do the second part of today, which is just going now over the code. We're gonna do, you know, uh, we're gonna move on to just uh, using some pre-trained models, but trying to understand how we would do some fine tuning of them by looking at a couple of examples of um, you know, transformer models from the transformer. So let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at 4.05. I'm gonna start generating this video and then um, yeah, we'll start in 10 minutes. Make sense? Yep, yep. All right guys, so I'll see you in 10. <laughs>